Thank you. For quite a while, we have had a uh, workshop, so to speak, on Brazilian politics, and David Fleischer has been the leader of that movement. There's no very, very few individuals that I know that I that know as much as to about Brazilian politics as this fellow here. Names and parties and history and trajectories and what have you. We are fortunate to have him on today to give us yet one more version of another transformational moment. We are living our own transformational moment in the society and politics. <laughs> Brazil started a bit earlier and in October 3rd and then the 30th. Right, right. So we have uh, it gave many of the results of those local or municipal elections were kind of uh, surprising to many people. And we are fortunate to have David and Georgie Alves to help us clarify the shifts in the party strength, the shifts in regions and uh, states, and then what it all means for the likely immediate and longer term future of Brazil. Brazil has elections in 2018, uh, presidential, presidential and... Governor, deputy, senator. Yeah, deputy. So it's a major... These elections are important in themselves, as well as in preparing the ground or shaping the dynamics, if you will, for the elections in 2018. So David, do you want to get started sir? Yeah. Well, Mauricio, thank you so much for this opportunity to chat about Brazilian elections and Brazilian politics. It's, it's great to be back here at the, at the Builder Center. As Mauricio was explaining, we're going to have general elections in 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, in Brazil, we have out of phase, two years out of phase elections, municipal elections this year, and then the rest general elections later in 2018. Uh, so uh, municipal elections have a, an impact on what's going to happen in the general elections uh, now, two years from now, 2018. <laughs> well, uh, just let's look at some background. Quickly comparing Lula and Jung, very, very different political style. Lula, as you know, was president between 2003 and 2010, and Jung was elected in 2010 and was impeached earlier this year. Lula came from the labor union movement, where you negotiated, articulated, talked with everybody every day. As president, he adopted the same modus operandi, talk, negotiate with all political parties and with the political sector, the private sector. Lula did have the confidence of the business sector. Lula also adored doing international relations and traveled overseas even more than Fernandini Cardozo had done in his eight years as president. Jilma did not negotiate, articulate with the parties, and not even with her own support coalition or her own party, the PT. As you know, Lula did what the Mexicans call a dead oscillator, saying she's going to be my succession candidate, and the PT sort of gulped and said, fine, okay. Uh, but she detested also doing international relations. And Senator Fernando Collar, who had also himself been impeached back in 92, said that he told her several times, don't neglect Congress and the parties. This was my downfall back in 92. And then Calder said, she did not listen to my voice of experience. This was Calder's speech during her impeachment process in the Senate. <clears throat> Lula had a very, very high approval rate in 2010, almost 80%. And in 2010, Brazil had a, a huge GDP increase, 7.5 in 2010. And as I said before, Lula imposed Dilma as the candidate uh, for the PT. In 2011, the economic model that had been quite successful during Lula's period began to decline. And in 2014 and 15, federal revenues began to decline 7 8% a year because of the recession that had set in uh, as of uh, 2013 and 14. Well, if you have declining revenues, you should either increase taxes or cut expenditures. Dilma didn't increase any taxes, but she increased expenditures and greatly increased and expanded the deficit. In 2015 and 16, the TCU, which is our federal accounting court, similar, not exactly the same as the GEO, GAO here, rejected her accounts. GDP in 2014 was minus 1.9. Last year it was minus 3.8. 
And this year, the economists tell us it may be a little, little bit better, minus 3.1. So we're in a continuing recession. <laughs> Impeachment began on the 5th of December uh, last year in 2015 when the President of the Chamber of Deputies accepted an impeachment request. On the 11th of April, the Chamber of Deputies Special Committee approved impeachment by 38 to 27. On the 17th of April, the Chamber approved the impeachment proceeding by a 367 to 137 vote. On the 12th of May, the Senate installed the impeachment process by 55 to 22 vote. Once the Senate installed the impeachment process, uh, President Juma was suspended for 180 days, and Vice President Michel Temer became the interim president. Uh, impeachment is in the Brazilian Constitution, as it is here in the U.S. Constitution. It begins in the lower house, and then sent to the upper house, and the upper house of the Senate sits as a, a jury to decide whether to impeach or not. So finally, on the 31st of August, the Senate finalized the impeachment, 61 to 20, and Michel Temer became what I would call full, or effective president. Then on the 13th of September, Eduardo Cunha was expelled from the Chamber of Deputies by a huge vote, 450 to 10. And Cunha was the one who began the impeachment process back in December of last year. But he was heavily involved in corruption accusations within Petrobras and had been suspended from being Chamber of Deputies President back in May by the Supreme Court, which is a very unusual decision by the Supreme Court. Uh, I can't resist putting in a few cartoons because as the Chinese say, you know, no, a picture is worth a thousand words. So here, Lula Joe having been run over apparently by a car or a truck, and he says, did you get the license number? And she says, well, no, only the last three digits. Three, six, seven. Well, as you recall, that's where three, six, seven came from, was the vote of the Chamber of Deputies. Cartoonists are taking advantage of situations. Well, <clears throat> this is the Lava Jato investigation, <clears throat> which looks at corruption, began looking at corruption in Petrobras with Petrobras contracts, but has since 2014 when it began has branched out of looking at other types of corruption in addition to Petrobras because of what we call plea bargaining. Plea bargaining uh, operates in Brazil since 2013, and ironically, President Juma signed the plea bargaining law, uh, uh, bill into law. So uh, conducted by uh, Judge Sergio Moro in Curitiba, we call this the Republica de Curitiba, the, the Curitiba Republic, invested corruption and bribe scheme at Petrobras. Directors, some, many directors of Petrobras were indicted and, uh, or were, excuse me, indicated, nominated, appointed by PT, PM, the BNPP, and other parties. And the bribes were offered by the, the construction companies to get contracts organized as a cartel of these 20 some large construction firms. And they received or, or had approved contract extensions over pricing and the bribes were divided among the directors of the Petrobras and also the party. It involved a lot of foreign companies who were su suppliers of equipment and services to Petrobras. Plea bargaining testimony began, and for the first time, many CEOs and CFOs, very, very, let's say, higher ups, were arrested, put in jail, and convicted. Some party militants also, some protected by the Foro Privilegiado, which is like a judicial privilege at the Supreme Court in Brazil. If you're a deputy or a senator or a minister, you can only be tried by the Supreme Court. <clears throat> Lula and Jomo were both indicted for obstruction of justice. We have 86 people convicted already and sentenced under the Lava Jato investigation. Politicians, money changers, lobbyists, ex-directors of Petrobras, CEOs, CFOs, intermediaries, in, and some other employees of the large construction firms. And still, another 101 investigations are underway, but new federal police operations uh, are carried out almost every week. So my 101, I think, is a little bit perhaps outdated now, this week. 
and more plea bargaining testimony from Odebrecht, which is the largest construction company in Brazil, OAS, another construction company, and Andrade Gutierrez, are in the process of being concluded and will perhaps generate another 100 inquests. Uh, a lot of people say that this final plea bargaining and testimony of Odebrecht is going to be what Brazilians call the end of the world. We'll have to see whether that's really going to be the case or not. Another cartoon. Maybe that starts next week? Uh, in, 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 yeah, the, uh, the testimony in Lula's investigation case is going to begin next week on the 21st. Well, no, no, no it's the following week, Thanksgiving week. Well, another cartoon. This guy is known here as the Japa of the federal police, the Japanese descent, federal police officer. So he's knocked on the door of Lula's apartment, and this is Lula's wife here, Marisa. And he says, where is Lula, daughter Marisa? And she's dressed up, as you can see, and said, my name is Adolfo. I don't know anyone named Lula. And as you can see, Lula is shaking uh, behind the door. That's not, that's a very, what should I say, nasty cartoon. This is another cartoon which is quite interesting. Jim is on the couch uh, being treated by Sigmund Freud. And she says, I have, I'm, I'm, I have a fearful, and I'll go to sleep in Brasilia and wake up in Porto Alegre. This is dream analysis, see. Uh, Porto Alegre is where she lives, her town. And then Freud says, well, that's better than waking up in Curitiba, don't you think? <laughs> oh, well. All right, now we're going to look at, after this background, we're going to look at the municipal elections. Uh, in October, we had two rounds of municipal elections, on the 2nd of October and then on the 30th, four weeks between the first round and the second round. 5,568 towns and cities, including 26 state capital cities, and 67 other larger cities with more than 200,000 voters. Why 200,000? Well, the legislation says that if you're a town, if you're a city that has more than 200,000 voters, your town is your city is eligible to have a second round. If no one gets an absolute majority, the two top candidates go at it in a second round. So Brazil always looks at the state capital cities and also the what we call the larger cities. <clears throat> the population of Brazil in 2016 was 206 million. <laughs> the electorate, as you can see, has increased in the last two municipal elections. Uh, 2008, we had 130 million voters. 2012, 140, and 2016, 144 million voters. In 2012, we had an increase of 7.2 percent of the of the electric, uh, in the electorate, and an abstention of 16.4. In 2016, the electorate increased less, only 4 percent over 2012, but our abstention was larger, 17.6 uh, percent. A few, a little more pieces of data. Eligible to vote in 2016. A majority of women, like, like also here in the US, 52.2%. 4.8% consi of the voters considered illiterates. 10.6% considered read and write only. 7% with a full eighth grade education. 19.2% complete high school. And 6.9% college education complete. So as you saw on the uh, analysis of what happened the day before yesterday here in the US, uh, there was a lot of analysis of whites without a college education, white men without a college education, white women without a college education, which were categories that they looked at a lot in the polls. So we also have what we call younger voters. The 1980 Constitution allowed 16 and 17 year olds to vote register and vote, uh, <clears throat> but on a voluntary basis, not obligatory. So back in 2004, we had 3.6 uh, million of these younger voters, which has then declined in 2008, 2012, and declined even more now in 2016, 2.6 million. When this first began in the 1990 and 92 elections, a lot of young people rushed to uh, registered to vote. Our daughter was one of those. She was 16 in 1990. Uh, 
Number of candidates by gender. Mayor, uh, in 2008, uh, 15,000 candidates were women. 11.12% of all the candidates for mayor. And five, uh, three, 437 were elected, 7.9%. In 2012, we had a few less candidates, but more were elected. 12% uh, 12, 12 were elected back in 2012. In 2016, we had more women running for mayor, almost 13%, and uh, but uh, less were elected, 637, less than were elected back in uh, 2012. For city council, we had, back in 2008, 21.4% were women candidates and 6 and 12.5% were elected. This uh, increased the number of candidates in 2012 and, and uh, slightly more, 13.3% were elected to city council. In 2016, we had a little bit, a slight increase in the number of candidates uh, and a small increase in the number of women elected, 13.5%. I was explaining to them that I was analyzing these municipal elections, I think it was back in 2004, at an American university, I can't remember which one. And so I explained to them that the Northeast region, which is supposedly the less developed region, had the highest percentage of women elected mayors. I think at that point there were 137 elected in the Northeast, a larger percentage than in the Southeast or in the South. And a man raised his hand, and the room was full of, full of women, American women, Hispanic women, and a lot of Brazilian women. And this man raised his hand and said, you don't understand the Northeast. All these women who were elected in the Northeast are all relatives of politicians. And boy, all the women in the room jumped on him, you're machista, machista. And I said to him, I can't answer your question. You have to look case by case to see if these women were elected in their own right of, of uh, participating politicians or whether they were elected because they were the wife or the, or the granddaughter or niece or whatever of, of a male politician. Uh, okay, uh, I've taken 15 of the 30 parties that participated and looked at the results. The first two columns are comparing 2012 and 2016. And as you can see, the PNDB has always elected the largest. And as you can see, 2016, a little bit less than they elected back in 2012. The big loser was right here. In 2012, the PT elected 655, and 2016 elected only 254, a drop of 61%. Of, uh, back in 2012, the PT was the third largest party that elected mayors. Uh, now, the big, more or less the big winner was the PSDB, uh, elected 718 back four years ago and, and, and 803 now in 2016, including the city of Sao Paulo, Brazil's largest city, which they took away from the PT. The PT elected the mayor of Sao Paulo back in 2012. The other party which is interesting to look at is the PSD. The PSD was organized as a new party back in 2011 and uh, elected 501 mayors in 2012, and was the fourth largest party in terms of mayors. Now it's come up to being the third largest party. You can see the PDT also increased a little bit here, 320 to 335, and the, uh, the Democrats declined a little bit. But the PPS, uh, the former Communist Party of Brazil, uh, lost a little bit, and the PRP, PRB, which is the uh, party of a lot of evangelicals or born-again Protestants, uh, increased considerably and elected the mayor of the city of Rio as well. The Green Party here advanced a little bit, and the PC B, the Communist Party of Brazil, also increased the number of mayors. But I compared the state capital cities, the 26 state capitals, you can see that the PT back then elected four state capitals and this year only one. And in the large cities elected zero. So for the PT in Brazil's largest cities, this was quite, quite a defeat. Lava Jato plus impeachment had a huge impact on the municipal elections. 
The PT was a big loser, as I said before, uh, and only elected one mayor of a capital, state capital city and disputed another nine on the second round runoff elections, but elected zero on the, on the uh, runoff. Only elected the capital of the state of Acre, Hill Brown. <laughs> Lost Sao Paulo in the first round. On the 30th of October, elected zero on the second round of, of state capitals and elected zero of the, uh, among the larger cities. Also, the PT was defeated in its, its home, home, home area, the ABCD, the, the, the cities around Sao Paulo, the red belt, the cult, the so-called red belt around Sao Paulo. Industrial. Industrial. Industrial cities around Sao Paulo. Uh, Lula's son, Marcos Lula, was elected to the city council in São Bernardo in 2012, but he was not re-elected in 2016. Lula was so turned off that he decided to abstain and not vote in the second round. If you're over 70 years old, Lula is 71, uh, you're not obliged to vote anymore. It becomes man, uh, uh, voluntary. So there's been a lot of pressures now uh, to refound and reorganize the PT, reorganize the PT, and refound and reorganize. Them and try to expel all the fichus sujas, the dirty records of people in the PT. On the 27th of October, Lula celebrated his 71st birthday. I could not resist putting this cartoon in. He has his birthday cake and he's 71. But he says, who is this smart ass guy who put that extra candle there? And I'm sure some of you know what 171 means. You all know what 171 means in Greek? No. It's one of the articles in the penal code, <laughs> uh, which is used extensively. A lot of cartoonists put Lula's apartment with the, the number of his apartment as 171, so I couldn't resist putting that in. The, <clears throat> the PSDB advanced uh, a fair amount in 2016. It had elected two, uh, 718 mayors four years ago, and now uh, elected 803 finally, when you put the first and second round together, uh, and up 12%. On the 2nd of October, the PM, PSDB elected the mayors of two state capital cities, uh, Sao Paulo and, and Sao Paulo, including Sao Paulo in the first round, and elected another five on the second round, elected 12 in the largest cities on the first round, and another nine on the second round. And so Sao Paulo governor, uh, Alchemy, was not able to elect his nephew to the city council of his hometown, but he was tremendously strengthened as the PSDB wins a lot of, won a lot of, uh, elected a lot of mayors in the interior of Sao Paulo. So Alchemy was, has been strengthened by this election. <clears throat> well, a lot of people ask this question, which I translated into Occupy PT. You know, you know what Occupy is, right? Occupy Wall Street, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we've had Occupy schools in Brazil, which interfered with the, the na nationwide high school graduate exam last Saturday and Sunday. And a lot of students occupied public schools, especially in Paranamata and other cities, against the constitutional amendment for the cap on expenditures and against a proposal to reform secondary education in Brazil. So Occupy PT. Which parties occupied this lost space that the PT lost all these, these municipal elections. Uh, the PT elected 384 less mayors than before. So who picked this up? The PMDB, the largest number, 108, PSDB 95, what I call non equals which are the tiny micro parties, uh, 59, the PP, the popular party, 51, PSD, which we talked about, PDT, Dan, etc. So these are the parties that picked up the empty space or lost space by the PT. Re-election. Uh, we always try to look at this, what mayors were re-elected. <laughs> because a re-elected mayor of a state capital city becomes a potential candidate for governor in the, in the two years later in the next election. So, eligible for re-election in 2008, seven, almost 77 percent were eligible for re-election, 2012, 73, and now this year less. Uh, 69%. Of the 
2,945 eligible to run for re-election in 2016. Uh, one, uh, uh, 1,385, 1,385 were re-elected. So I, here I have uh, these major parties and how many ran for re-election and how many were re-elected and what re-election rate or per percentage were re-elected. PSDB, 53% re-election rate. PSB, the Socialist Party, 50.1%. The same as the PR. The PMDB came in a little bit less, almost 49%. And the, uh, as you can see, the average was 47%. PP right at the average, PT a little bit less. Hey, what, is, what is the PP? PP is a popular party. This is Malufi's party. Malufi. It used to be Adana, then PDS, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's called PP. And the PR? PR is the Republican Party, which used to be the PL. <laughs> but after the 2006 election, it changed its name <clears throat> and incorporated pronoun. Into the, into the party and changed its name. The PDT is the Brazola's party. Brazola, of course, died in 2004. The PSD is this new party that I explained. PTB is the old uh, Labor Party. DEM is what used to be called the PFL and PT. So you can see the PT had the lowest re-election rate uh, of 37%. The PSD is Kassabe, right? PSD. Yeah, PSD is, uh, is Kassabe, right, exactly. So is there in Sao Paulo, the Spin off of the well, the, the PSD is a very interesting party. It was founded back in 2011, but it brought in a lot of what, what I call experienced politicians from the PFL and from some other parties, and a lot of mayors joined this party as well. So that's why they were able to elect a, a large number of mayors back in 2012, the fourth largest uh, amount of mayors, which is very surprising for a party that was only one year old. Uh, but now, in the second round, as we saw before, it increased the number of mayors that it elected. So it's Kassabi's party, but it is considered a party of very experienced politicians. <clears throat> the Michel Temer government, how is our new president doing? He began with a lot of problems when he took office on May 12th. His cabinet was organized with only white old men. No younger men, no women, no Afro-Brazilians. Uh, he said that this was because all of the case cabinet ministers were all named by the parties participating in his government coalition. And so it wasn't really his own choice. That was his explanation. Thirteen of the ministers who were named have some accusations at the Supreme Court, and three or four were forced to resign within the first month. The main objective of this new government is to try to convince markets that necessary fiscal reforms will be approved so that the private sector will go back to investing again, creating new jobs with innovation and showing that this new government is what we call market friendly. Uh, it got to the point where the private sector had absolute zero confidence in the Juma government and was not investing anything at all. And so that's one of the reasons why we have such in addition to the recession, such a large unemployment rate of almost 12%. <clears throat> and every month, there's a tabulation of new jobs created. But almost for almost the last two years, that's been negative. Instead of new jobs created, jobs eliminated, net, net jobs eliminated. All right, the markets are positive about this new government, but they were not only international markets, but domestic markets, but they have adopted what you might call a wait and see. Good intentions, but let's see what you can produce. Very important. Uh, and Nikki Midalis is the finance minister. And as you remember, uh, Midalis was Lula's central bank president for eight years. This is one of Lula's tremendous heresies that he created or did back in late 2002 against all PT dogma. PT dogma had been very, very anti international banks. So Lula appoints an international banker who's just been elected by the PSDB party to be president of the central bank. And uh, in addition to other heresies, supposed heresies that Lula committed back in 2002. Yes? Two minutes. Okay, all right. So Temer has been very cautious as interim president <clears throat> so far. He has had some victories. On the 5th of October, the chamber approved the, the pre-salt legislation, which has now been approved by the Senate, which has, which says that uh, in the pre-salt petroleum exploration area, 
the Petrobras is no longer obliged to invest in all of these petroleum explorations. On the 11th of October, PEC 241, the Tetra de or the cap on expenditures, was approved. 26 deputies in Temer's block voted no. And this uh, was approved on the second round on the 15th of October. Now is in the Senate. Uh, Temer's coalition is larger than Lula's or Joe's. And we have this thing called the Centrum, which has now been redraftized as the Centro Democratico, which is a large group of medium sized and small parties uh, that support the, the government. The problem is that this has created a dispute uh, to see who's going to elect the next president of the Chamber of Deputies on the 1st of February. And this, this Centrum, Centro Democratico, has two potential candidates. The PSDB also at one point thought it would elect the president of the Chamber of Deputies, but we're not really sure how that's going to work out. Uh, fiscal reform. This is the, really the big casino that everyone is waiting to see. Reduce the size of the cabinet uh, that Temer did. Reduce federal appointees, which he's been doing. Eliminate duplication of benefits, which many people were drawing two or three different benefits. Revise the inclusion uh, circumstances of the Bolsa Familia. Revise sick leave benefits via NSES, the Social Security Administration. Reduce or eliminate subsidies to certain sectors of the economy. This is 20, 224 billion of subsidies and what we call disonerations, tax exemptions, et cetera, have been granted to certain sectors of the economy. This, as you might imagine, for the private sector will be very painful for this to be reduced. Help states and cities with fiscal difficulties how to use the repatriation of overseas dollars held by Brazilians. Uh, this ended on Halloween, the 31st of October, almost 47 billion. Not repatriated, but 15% tax and 15% fine. They expect maybe another 20 billion in 2017. This, this constitutional amendment would put a ceiling on expenditures for 20 years. Each year, the expenditures could be increased by the previous year's inflation. That's fairly drastic. Social Security reform. This is another big, important reform. Ever-expanding deficit, 50 billion in 1485 last year, and maybe 120 deficit this year. Absolutely necessary for fiscal reform. In urban areas, the Social Security system has a five billion surplus, but in rural areas, uh, 82 billion deficit. 72.5% of uh, are covered by Social Security, which has 52, right now, 52 million contributors contributing to Social Security and 32 million retirees or pensioners. This is the same problem in the US where the percentage of contributors is low, re reducing, being reduced, and the number of people receiving benefits is increasing. This also is a big problem in Europe as well. Problems. 26 billion tax evasion, non-payment of Social Security. 62 billion lost with tax incentives. And another 700 billion in private sector past Social Security debts, where private sector firms have not paid their Social Security payments on their employees. Unify all systems into one single system. Reaction from privileged groups, military, public servants, legislature, judges, etc. Increase the minimum retirement age to 65. Those already 50 would be left in the old system. Those under 50 would be grandfathered into the new system. Mm -hmm. Big, big, big dispute, big debate. Transition rules for Social Security. The end of special retirement systems. The final goal of 65, age, minimum age 65, with 48 years of contributions. 50% of the average contributions would be your final premium, and an extra 1% for extra years worked over 65. Minimum contribution would increase from 15 years to 25. Here in the US, the minimum contribution would draw some Social Security, that's my case here in the US, 10 years. Uh, so it would, there it would be, uh, it's now 15, we'll go to 25. Eliminate gender differential incrementally. Currently, uh, there's a five year differential. Men can re women can retire five years earlier than men. And the pension for widows or widowers would only be 50% of the, of the 
the benefit of the person deceased. Uh, rural workers would have to contribute to Social Security right now, they don't. Lois, uh, the social programs would be readjusted by inflation. Pension increases would no longer be tied to the minimum wage. The end to parity between active workers and retirees. Big problem. The military. Increase the minimum time of service from 30 to 35 years and end to comp a compulsory retirement age and eliminate pensions for single daughters. If you're a military officer, your single daughters, if they're not legally married, uh, can receive a uh, benefit. And prohibit the accumulation of retirement benefits and pension benefits. Yeah, you're running out of time. Well, just finally, this is the final part. Labor legislation, considered sacred by labor union centrals, reduce and eliminate some of the social overhead, now 103%. Vacation time proportionate to time of service, which is the case here in the U.S. Currently, everybody gets 30 days vacation. 13-month wage paid at the end of the year, something also very sacred. Outsource labor contracts, flexibilize the labor legislation from the 40s, labor agreements between unions and respective firms. Uh, Part-time labor contracts, job protection probably will not become permanent, and tax reform. Tax reform is the big never-ending story in Brazil. All right, final, final slide. What to expect? If the economy begins to improve somewhat in 17 and 18, the finance minister is going to become a very strong candidate for president, and he came me down. The two Tucanos, Ayasu, Neves, José Serra, and Alchemy, are all three pre-candidates for president. As I said before, Alchemy has been strengthened by the PSDB wins in Sao Paulo, but Serra and Ayasu have some problems with Lava Jato due to plea bargaining and testimony. Ayasu's candidate lost the election for mayor in Belo Horizonte. Some people have even said Cardoso should come back, but I don't think no. that's going to happen. <laughs> Lula would not be viable in 2018. By then, he may be in jail. The PT might support the PDT candidate, Ciro Gomes, who got 12% of the vote in 98 in 2002. The Democrats might launch Senator Ronaldo Cayaba. Goiás, but more pro most probably he will run for governor. And the hedging with Marina Silva, again, would probably run for president, and maybe 20% of the valid vote like she got in 2010 and 2014. She had a very, very weak performance in 2016. Her party had a weak performance. Okay, I thank you very much for your attention, and maybe we'll have some questions later on. Hey, one, one, sure, go ahead. Yeah. One current fine question. On the first part of your presentation, the party in the elections, which parties are now the strongest parties in Brazil? The top four, let's say. Well, the top four are uh, PMDB, PSDB, and the PSD, and to a certain extent, the Socialist Party, PSB. Those are the four largest and strongest parties in the municipal elections and also in Congress. Where, where would you place your PT in the... Tenth. Tenth rank. Uh, there is a uh, rule of thumb in Brazil that says if you, in a, in a municipal election like this year, if you elect a lot less mayors than you did before, that means two years later, 2018, you're going to elect a lot less deputies. If your party elects a lot more mayors, two years later, your party's going to elect more deputies. So if the PT lost 61% of its mayors in 2016, that means it's going to elect maybe half of what it elected in 2014, in 2018, maybe 30 deputies. So that is a very, very bad projection of this rule of thumb for the PT. So meanwhile, for the next few months, next two years, the government of the federal government has enough support from those four parties to implement much of its agenda? Yes, yes. But as you, as you, as you might imagine, some of the agenda is very conflicted. If you're going to do Social Security reform, which is a very, very important reform, that's going to split a lot the opinions of the deputies in Tamar's block. And so approving the, the ceiling, the cap on expenditures, that has been relatively easy. But the Social Security reform is going to be very difficult and may, uh, let's say, put a lot of uh, cracks in his, uh, in his coalition. Okay. Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. Um, talk a little bit about the Brazilian election. You know, we 
we always think the thing that we're studying is the most overwhelming thing. And then, you know, two days ago, that nobody wants to talk about the zero anymore. So, um, but thank you for coming. So we're gonna what we're gonna do today. So is look a little bit. I'm gonna tell you a story a little bit about how the how the PT has fared, right? So so the, the Workers Party, which is the you know the used to be the incumbent party at the national level, how it's fared in the Brazilian Northeast, and, and it's really interesting because. Uh, Hopefully, what I'm going to be doing is drawing some parallels for what we can understand about Brazilian politics and, and what's how the PT is likely, um, what's likely to happen to the PT based on some of the things that we can observe in the Northeast. Um, so I'm going to tell you this story. We'll build from there, and then hopefully, if you guys have any questions, we can go from there. So, you know, I mean, this seems like it happened a century ago um, when Lula was elected, right? The first working class northeastern origin president of Brazil. But interestingly, when he was elected, this is all news at this point, right? When he was elected, he wasn't elected with a northeastern vote. Um, there used to be this maxim in northeast uh, in Brazilian politics, and it applied especially to the northeast, which is the less economically developed um, region of Brazil. That uh, poverty don't vote in poverty, right? The poor people don't vote for, for poor; they vote for the rich, and that's why the northeast used to have disproportionately economic elites, old economic elites, as their their rulers. Um, so what I'm going to show you here is one big transformation that's been covered in the literature for quite some time now, which is what we're looking at here at the municipal level um, is the PT vote share. So the, the, the vote share for the PT presidential candidate in the Northeast, and this is at the municipal level. So each one of these little, you know, little boxes there, uh, these little polygons is a, is a municipality. And what we're going to see is this spread or this um, red wave or, um, that's going to take over the Northeast. So here in 1998, when Lula lost the election to Fernando Henrique Cardoso, um, very low levels of vote for the PT. Um, this is by 2002. Lula's elected. There's a significant high, significantly higher vote share, but not that high. But look what's going to happen in 2006. For, so for Lula's re-election, Right? So this is when the vote for the PT has migrated from historically its base in the south, in the southeast of Brazil, heavily into the northeast. And this isn't just going to be a Lula thing. This isn't Lulismo, right? Uh, well, we don't, we don't quite know. Um, but for Dilma's election in 2016, oh, I'm sorry, 2010, what we see is that the reds get really deeper red. So some municipalities are talking about 96% vote share at some of the extremes. Of course, these are the smaller ones, the larger cities. You never quite get that high, but you're, you're easily beating um, the national averages. Um, these PT candidates all went to the second round nationally, which means that they didn't get a majority in the first round, but they massively won the Northeast starting in 2006. So with 60, 65% of the vote, if you would count just the Northeast, right? Um, this in itself is, is transformational. But I think the more interesting story um, is the subnational penetration that the PT has then um, proceeded. So, the PT in 2006 elected its first governor in the Northeast, Wellington Gias, in the state of Piauí, one of the poorest states in the country. Um, in the next electoral cycle, um, I'm sorry, see, they elected him in 2002 the first time. He was re-elected in 2006. In 2006, um, the PT elected Jacques Wagner the, for the first time the governor of Bahia. Um, dislodging one of the you know most deeply entrenched um, old school elites in in Brazil, Antonio Carlos Magalhães, um, but in other states in the Northeast as well, like Sergipe, um, who elected Marcelo Deda. So the interesting story here is that it's not only voters are no, not only migrating at the presidential level, but also at the subnational level, which is how you know clientelistic politics and is how. Um, so just to give you an idea of what this looks like, the curve looks like in terms of, in each of these electoral cycles, for the PT's share of elected North, uh, officials in the Northeast, so this is pre-Lula, pre-Lula as well, so very low, I mean, the, this is the mayors, this is federal deputies, state deputies, and then once 
once you have Lula's election, and the mayor's here is two years after, as David had explained. So this is T plus two. Um, this is like midterm elections, right? And then you see the big jump. Let's not talk about that yet, but, um, but we'll get there in a second. So all right, so the, but this penetration is significant. Its success um, in, in, in subnational elections is, is quite large. Is, is quite large. Is, is else in the country. And if you, when you go down to the closest level, right, so the, to the local level, um, what this is showing you is the number, is the number of, this number in white is the number of governors, I'm sorry, mayors, that the PT has elected nationally. Um, and the lighter part of the bar here is the northeastern component. Um, and what's happening over time is, first of all, before it was pra pra practically negligible 10%, and what this chunk of the bar is going to continue to grow. So the Petit's dependence in the Northeast, even at the local level, is going to increase. And here, the 2016 numbers are particularly revealing, right? So this is the collapse, a decline of 60% in the number of mayors from the last election to this election. But in the Northeast, it was a little bit of a controlled descent, right, compared to the national number, where the Petit has still did, did relatively better. The decline was only 38%. <clears throat> so northeastern mayors now account for almost half of all mayors that the PT has in Brazil. So this is the party of, if you want to think in terms of the Collier and Collier shaping the political arena, the you know the classic incorporation of unions from from you know so outside of São Paulo, Rio Grande do Sul, all that story. That's that's not what this is anymore, right? So so the PT is now deeply a party of the northeast, not only a party of the northeast, but increasingly dependent on that. Um, there's a couple explanations for why this might be, right? So the people who have, who have looked at this data at the national and even at the regional level said, okay, there's a couple of things that might be going on here. First, it could be a story of economic development. It could be a story that the Northeast used to be poor. It's still poorer than in other parts of Brazil, but it has been growing. It has becoming, it, it is becoming increasingly urban. And those urban voters um, historically have sided with parties in the left and, and especially the PT. There's a, there's a policy story, a democracy slash policy story, which is, all right, so there's a massive, well, actually not really massive, it's, it's, it's relatively cheap, um, but affecting a lot of people, social program that's clearly programmatic, it's breaking the clientelistic ties uh, so that mayors can no longer pick and choose who they're going to reward, and therefore the poor being free by vertical competition between the federal government and the local level government um, are finally free to vote for whoever they want. And if they want to reward those who bring them with social policies, then so be it. Um, um, Wendy Hunter, um, but especially Margaret Keck early on, telling a story that the PT had a logic of difference. The PT is a European party in a Brazilian party system, right? It's to the extent that it, it was actually a party with ideological coherence. It had strong internal rules as to who could join the party, um, whether you had to vote with what the party decided, to contribute to the party, all these kinds of things. And at the heart of this story of how, you know, some people have argued, you know, David Samuel, Cesar Zucco, um, Al Monteiro, and Brandon Van Dyke, they're telling a story of partisanship that, uh, they're saying that the reason why the PT expanded in the Northeast is because the North, because the PT used resources for being in the presidency to build parties at the local level, to really challenge these bastions of conservatism in the Northeast. And and you know at the center of the story is the is is the story of local party building, that the PT opened all these giratorios, these party directories at the local level, especially where they didn't have any networks. Um, and they're making partisans. They're slowly, you know, transforming northeastern voters um, into partisan voters. So goes the story, right? And uh, you know, if you if you search on Google for these, I mean, they're, they're really quaint. Um, you know, they, they have these little, you know, sometimes they're little apartments, sometimes they're little homes, sometimes they're little, you know. But in a nutshell, it captures this difference of the bit there. I don't know if it's the northeasterner in me. But I call BS on this. I don't believe it. I don't believe this story very much at all. Um, what I'm seeing, by, first by looking at Bahia, um, and we have a forthcoming article coming out in the Journal of Comparative Politics, 
where we looked at this story in Bahia. And now what I'm going to show you here is when we build up this logic from Bahia to the rest of the Northeast, is a little uh, not so happy story, which is um, the Bete expanded in the Northeast not by being different. It expanded in the Northeast because it learned how to play ball. It learned how to play Northeastern politics. It learned how to play Brazilian politics. Um, and I'll explain in a second what, what we mean by this. Um, but it's basically two strategies. It's learning how to leverage incumbency and leveraging resources and aligning levels of government. So using the power and using the resources that you have for sitting at the presidency to leverage governorships. And from there for leveraging the presidency and the governorships into local level um, elections. And these are tried and true Northeastern, you know, situacionismo, governismo, incumbent politics. Um, and this is going to have an effect in the way that the PT grew. And it's also going to have an effect to how sturdy is the PT's presence in the Northeast once it now lost the presidency. Right? So the first strategy that we're going to talk about is leveraging and aligning these levels of government. And here I'm showing you the old and the new. So, you know, this is Antonio Carlos Maranhães long time quasi dictator of the state of Bahia, leveraging connections to Fernando Henrique Cardoso. And here is the Bahia governor, Jacques Wagner, with Lula. And basically, the, the story kind of goes like this. What I've kind of done here is shown you what the alignment of governors are. And it's almost a law of Northeastern politics that governors in Bahia align whoever's the president. So basically, this is kind of like the left-right spectrum here. And if you look at whenever you have a president on the right, 1982, 86, 1990, 94, 98, um, all of the governors are either of the incumbent party or they're allied with the incumbent party. So. For example, in 1982, for example, almost the first elections of the transition to democracy, almost every state elected a governor from the opposition, the PMDB. Every single governor in the Northeast was from the incumbent military support party, right? Used to be the Ariana. Um, later, the PMDB with Zahney. Uh, Collar didn't have a very strong party, but everybody else was aligned, had some role in the, in the Collar government. Um, the two Cardozo governments, lots of PFL governors in here. And then what you're going to see is that it's going to take one electoral cycle. This is Lula's maiden victory right here, where nobody really knew what was going to happen. Most of the governors kind of elected were still to the political right. And four years later, what's going to happen is that, first of all, the PT is going to have a lot more electoral success. And then people are going to scurry and align with the PT. Um, and that's going to get increasingly large. But it's also going to be a rule for 2014, Dilma's that's, re-election. That's very traditional. Yes, it's absolutely. That's the story that we're telling, right? We're telling the story of, exactly. of continued tradition. What does this look like? And you know, let me just slap that on a map so you can see what's happening. Um, all right, so these are the electoral cycles. And, and here, whenever you see like a shade of red, we're talking about PT vote share. This is for the president. This is for governors. Whenever you see orange here, it's an allied party. So the PT has to be formally allied in the candidacy. And here we just, we're just plotting the municipal, the number of municipalities um, that the PT has. And basically the story is, you know, this is a top-down driven strategy. What you're going to see when we go through the cycles is that it always gets red here first. It stretches from here to here, and then from here to here. And this is a little bit less than this, and this is a little bit less than this. All right? So there's a temporality thing, and there's also the level of power story. Um, so, no PT governor in 1998, Lula lost, and look at what we're, so if I can get this to work, that's 2002, Lula's first election, PT elects one governor, hits and misses here in Bahia, still a very small number of municipalities, here's Lula's re-election, mm -hmm. right. by the way, so here, the PT the national strategy was that the PT was going to field a candidate in every state to try to give Lula a platform. Um, they only won a few, and they decided that that was no longer going to be the strategy. So after the 2006 strategy, the PT only runs to win. 
right? So when they run, a, when they feel a governor, a governor candidate, they win. And if they know that they're not going to win, then they run with an ally. So you're going to see that the orange part of this is going to get bigger and bigger. And this is going to tell one other part of the story, which is alliance making. Um, so for 2010, you know, so this is spreading from here to here. You see that the places where the PT runs gov gubernatorial candidates, they win by a lot. They back. So really, in this electoral cycle here, there was only one state where the PT or an ally didn't win. Right? And the mayors, you know, even though it's growing, it's much less. So what we've been running is, and I apologize for it, I had a little technical snafu today, so I don't have the 2014 maps to show you, but I do have the, this number to show you that this is the number of PT mayors broken down by the relationship to the governor. So the blue is whenever the governor is in opposition to the PT or vice versa, the red part here is where the PT holds a governor, and then the orange part of this is where it's an allied governor. So what we're seeing here is that even though the PT is making alliances, disproportionately where they're expanding, so they expand more where they have the governor. That's when you can channel resources more directly. Um, when they have allies, you know, they grow a little bit, they grow a little more in 2012, but then the story of the collapse, right, is that what they're, where they're really going to hurt are in the states governed by allies, because the allies, again, are the ones that are going to betray them, mm -hmm. um, be, the way that they made allies, right? So it's going to turn out that increasingly important it is that the PT only has mayors anymore in the states where it governs, right? So, uh, and this is a story of executive alignment and leveraging, right? So you leverage the presidency into getting governors, and you leverage that control of the governorship to, to expand down to the municipal level. How is this happening? Because mayors really need resources, right? I mean, municipalities in Brazil have a lot of responsibilities, primary education, primary health care, um, housing. There's a series of policies that they are, you know, municipalities are very resource hungry. And, and they don't have a lot of revenue bases themselves, especially in the Northeast. So they need resources. And especially during the recession. Yeah, especially in the, you know, you know a lot of these municipalities are dependent in the fiscal transfers anyway. Um, but when the economy tanks, then they, they're dependent them, on them even more. Um, another way of looking at this is, what's the share of PT mayors in each state, depending on whether the governor, you know, is a, is a pechista, an ally, or a party that's in opposition to the PT. And this is the big collapse. Look, so, okay, so this was halved. It's no small feat, but look at what happened here. So they almost disappear from allied governors. Right, the states that are governed by allies. Um, so the one thing is leveraging, right? Oops, sorry about that. We're gonna, I guess that kind of spoiled that part of the story. But, um, one thing is leverage. I got a PT shirt on her. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the beauty of it. If you don't know who she is, she's Sunday's daughter, right? Um, um, so this is part of the story. It's leveraging executive. She was my student. Was she really? Yeah, back in the 70s. Well, maybe you taught her well. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. The other strategy um, that the PT uh, used to expand into the Northeast, again, to get from the playbook of people like Antonio Carlos Magalhães, is building opportunistic alliances. So if the part of the PT brain before was rejecting the, the, the usual way of doing politics in Brazil, and only having programmatically, ideologically coherent alliances, that one's going to get scrapped, right? And it's going to get scrapped at the national level in a very key way when they include first the PL, you know, which is the liberal party, the pro-business party, but later with the incorporation of the PMDB, the big centrist party in Brazil, into their coalition. And at the state level, this is going to get a little worse. Um, and at the local level. So in Bahia, part of the story of electing Jacques Wagner was, um, let me see if my mouse shows, was co-opting this guy here, Jadal Vieira Lima. Um, we know this guy is bad business, bad news, because he is now um, 
what is he? The chief, one of the chief of staff, chiefs of staff in a way, the political operator in the yeah. Temer government, yeah. right? So he made a deal so that the PT could win by year and dislodge the Carlistas in the FBI. Yeah. He's PMDB. Uh, PMDB. Yeah, he's a PMDB, right? But so they had got to appoint the vice governor under the PT, and here's how you get all the big wigs, right? Lula, Gilma, Wagner, Jadel. Mm -hmm. In Ceará, they made a, an alliance with the Gomez brothers. I mean, it's hard to tell you, you know, so David was talking about how Ciro Gomes might run under the PDT, which is a center-left party in Brazil. Ciro Gomes has, has had seven political parties. So clearly the political party label is not what matters. Um, he's been a minister for Cardoso. He's been a member of the PSDB. He's been a member of, I forget how many, PROS, PSB, now he's in the PDT. So these are the kind of political opportunists that are looking for connections, right? Um, he began it on him. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt that. Yeah, no, that's right. I yeah, that's he, true. He began the military government. Yeah. <laughs> and the big story of, you know, sometimes where this really kind of pops at the seams is when you don't even look for former people of the right who have moved somewhat to the center left. But when you make allegiances where the PT abandoned, it, you know, their, their friends in the left to run like they did in Maranhão, with Rosiana Sarney. By the way, so she was a pre-candidate, so not a full candidate for president, under the PFL, which is the, you know, to the extent that we have a far right party, well, it's not really a party, there's, there's further right than the PFL, but, but the big right party in Brazil, right? Um, the, P, the PT abandoned the PCdoB and all their, their other leftist friends to run in conjunction. Um, here's the picture that I kind of gave away before. Um, <laughs> where I can, this offends me and, I, and I'm not a pechista, right? Um, you can rest assured that a classical PT founder looks at this picture and they want to puke, right? Um, so she's here in the Diretorio, Estado Alto, PT in Maranhão. She's putting on the shirt. Here's the vice governor of Maranhão from the PT, ran in her. Um, this is how the PT was incorporated. And this is the president of the PT in Maranhão. Um, so part of the story is, leveraging resources. Part of the story is doing business with questionable people um, that historically the PT had as a rule that they wouldn't do. But now the governor is a communist. That's right. <laughs> but we'll, we'll get to that story in a second. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> you got three more minutes. So one part that I want to show you about the way that the, the story of the PT at the local level can be misleading is that even though the PT expanded, right, in those maps that I showed you, the number's always getting a little bit bigger. It's never quite so big. Um, some people benefited much bigger. It's benefited much more than the PT at the local level were the allies. And this is analysis that we're still doing for all the northeastern municipalities, but I can show you this example in Bahia. So in Bahia, the key thing was winning the governorship in 2006. They got a big payout in the 2008 municipal elections. Um, and the way that you can see this is that the PT expanded these, these darker red um, boxes here. But there's a lot more pink, which is part of the ally, allied coalition, than there is the red. Um, and if you separate, one party alone disproportionately benefited from this, which was the payment debate, which back then they were in cahoots together. Um, <laughs> There's two ways of thinking about this. All right, so maybe they, you know, these were the people who used to be defeated and now they're here and they're new and they're bringing in the new types of politics. 54% um, of those mayors were brand new. They hadn't been elected before. 46 were re-elected. I don't know what this means. Um, you know, even though there's five times as many, but then what we did is that we went and we looked name by name to see who are these people. Is this an actual transformation? Are they vanquishing the old elites? Are these new political um, elites that are being formed? And the answer is no. Turns out that half of the mayors that were elected that year under the Pemi de Bay label switched into the Pemi de Bay for that election. Right, so this is a story of continued opportunism, right? Um, and interestingly, 40% of the PMDB mayors in that election were sitting mayors who switched party label to run for re-election. You know what this means in practice is, I want the power of incumbency and I want to be changed. I want to be both things. I want to be 
establishment and change at the same time. And the Brazilian system allows you to do that. Because right? you can change party label. So somebody who was elected under the PFL, somebody who was elected under you name it, um, got to switch and benefit from being part of the alliance. Yeah? So, in, in, you know, people like this guy here. So this is a quintessential Bahia story that also happened in the rest of the Northeast. So this, is, this guy here is um, Tato Pereira. He's the mayor of a small town of Cachoeira, a very beautiful historical city uh, in the Reconca of Baiano. And here he is uh, trying to get votes for Jacques Wagner. Wagner's vice governor candidate is this guy here called Otto Ranca, and he is a former governor of Bahia who used to be allied with Antonio Carlos Magalhães. Um, here is a PT candidate for senator. Here is a former PSDB candidate, sorry, um, for senator as well. And here are candidates for deputy, state deputy, federal deputy. By the way, this guy here, Agolo, was one of the first people to go to jail for Lava Jato. Um, this guy switched into the PMDB to run with Wagner. He has since changed parties three more times. Um, mayors are the most pragmatic actors in Brazilian politics. They care about one thing, which is getting resources to their town. Doesn't mean that they're all corrupt. That's not what we're saying here. I mean, there's some bad smelling stuff that happens in there, but they're the most pragmatic actors. What they care about is bringing resources to the town because that's what they're gonna be judged on. And they jump. And they jump when things are good, and then they jump again when things are bad. And that's what's happening to the PT, right? Because no longer does it control the spigot. So the PT, you know, some people said that the PT transformed Northeastern politics. I disagree with that entirely. I think the PT benefited and learned how to play Northeastern politics, and they played it really well. But the problem is this alliance strategy only works if you can control the resources. Um, and that problem is now gone. Right? So the PT can't play that card anymore. It got really good at doing that, but it had to give up what it wanted to do, which is transform the way that Northeasterners did politics. That's out the window. Um, so notice then that while they control, and the good thing is, in the article we said, while they were saying um, the happened, and we said, if we're right, what's going to happen is that the number of PT mayors is going to collapse everywhere, but it's going to hold in the places that they have governors. And you know, bad for Brazil, but good for my career, that we were right. Right? So nowadays, more than anything, it's two states where the PT controls here, that they have a lot of mayors. Everywhere else, they're done. And our prediction is that once they lose these governors, which they're likely to do, yeah, and this number will yeah, Piauí and Bahia and Ceará right now. Um, Ceará might be a slightly different story because you know they're still friends with the Gomes brothers and all that stuff. But Bahia in POE, very popular gov governors, by the way. Um, this is what's holding this. You know, mayors respond. They've learned over time that you respond to who's on top, who's ahead of you. And once you get the signal that the person ahead of you is going to change, that's when you jump. So they haven't jumped. Just like here, they didn't jump. When Lula was elected here, in between, but the governor was still in a Sammy's party, in the PFL, they didn't jump, it was still, they wait. When it becomes clear that, you know, the governor might go, that, that's when they jump. And the only way I think that the PT is going to come back and become a, a major political party is if they actually do what the people in the literature were saying that they were doing, which is build partisans at the local level, which I don't think they did very well in the Northeast. If they did it, but they didn't do it anywhere as well as people say. Um, the PT needs to refound itself, what David was saying, right? It needs to go back to its roots and stop doing that kind of stuff that we saw it doing. But the problem is that now the, the, the brand might be damaged. How do we know this? This is the candidate for mayor of Belo Horizonte, one, you know, a city that tends to vote pretty to the left. And the one thing that, that you know, I didn't show you what these things used to look like, but this is off brand for the PT. First of all, where's the red? <laughs> and second of all, where's the star? Right? So if you know anything about how the PT does politics and its strong brand and cert strong brand identification, this of course is not the majority. But this is an important city, right? Belo Horizonte is the third or fourth largest, arguably the third most important city in the country. Um, look at this. This is another candidate. For Porto Alegre. 
Porto Alegre, come on, this is the birthplace of participatory budgeting. There's a little bit more red in there, but where's the star, man? This is not the election where people are branding the PT. So, you know, this refunding is going to have to be really serious for if it's going to work. They didn't, um, even, they didn't even get the second half. Yeah. <laughs> George, but, uh, you finished? Yeah. So, that's it. Less transformational than meets the eye. Um, so, you know, it, if, if you get good by doing what everybody else is doing, when you lose the advantage that everybody else had before, right? The collapse that happened to the PFL in the Northeast before, the PSDB at the national level, now it's the PT's, the PT's turn. Um, and it's not gonna be pretty, I think, for a while, unless they go back and they start rebuilding from the ground up like they did at the beginning. Hey, thank you. Jorge, thank you for a bold, fresh presentation. Thank you. Well, questions and comments? Well, one comment on what he said, which the party's switching. No one has really examined what happened to the PT last year and early this year. Yeah. A lot of PT mayors switched yeah. parties. A lot of PT mayors, PT mayors, a lot of PT mayors, a lot of PT mayors switched parties to run for re-election this year. Yes. But we don't really have any numbers yet. Maybe I would say somewhere between 70, 80, 90 PT mayors switched parties to run for re-election. But we don't really know how they did, how many were re-elected and how many were not. The switching for the governors, as I said before, in 2014, the PC to B, the Communist Party of Brazil, elected the governor of Maranhão, the first communist governor. And so, uh, Flavio Gino, a former uh, prosecutor. <clears throat> in these municipal elections, this party, the PC to B, elected maybe 50 or 60 mayors in, 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 in Maranhão, who switched parties to get into the governor's party, because the governor was handing out a lot of allotments, yes. goodies, et cetera. So this Marignon is another good example of party switching to align yourself with the governor, exactly. Yeah, there's, there's a, now it's the, the flip side of this 2008 story that I was showing you before. Now, I, you know, this is the data that we're currently yes. on top of, like following name by name to see, but the, what the evidence seems to be showing is that now it's the other way around. The people who joined the PT late or now jumping ship, mm -hmm. right, to, mm -hmm. to go to other party labels because they want to be elected. So, of course, throughout all this, there's still the hardcore PT founders, old way of doing things that are in there, but those people kind of got sidelined for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think now it, there's some major process of, of reshuffling that's happening. And all that bloat, the opportunistic bloat, is kind of going away. How does the Bolsa Familia fit into the current picture um, with Tamer? It sounds like uh, um, it, it's in a much shakier kind of condition now. And if it, if it does uh, decline, you know, it, it sounds like what the Bolsa Familia in the Northeast reduced dependency of poor people on the traditional elites. Are those elites going to? Going to come back if the Bolsa da Familia uh, declines, or are there going to be? Is it is it going to be coming out of uh, Brasilia, who's, who's ever in control of it, or are they going to take uh, uh, gain this gain support because of the Bolsa da Familia, or you know what's going to what's happening with that? Yeah, the Bolsa Familia reaches about 13 Bolsa million Familia. million families, mm -hmm. which means about. 40 million voters, maybe, nationwide. And Bolsa Familia is heavily concentrated in the Northeast. Uh, he mentioned Wendy Hunter, who's a professor at the University of Texas, but also Timothy Power, who was at Oxford. In 2006, they did a correlation, municipal, min, uh, municipality by municipality, of the percentage of Bolsa Familia in that municipality and the votes that the PT got in 2006. And the correlation was very high. They did this again in 2010, and the correlation was pretty high, but not quite as high as in 2006. Uh, what Temer has done is, is doing what we call a fine-tooth comb on all of these programs and saying, OK, look at Bolsa Familia, look at all these other, other uh, programs to see if everyone who's in the program is eligible. Eligible means you can't have any income above a, 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 a ceiling. And so they've eliminated somewhere every, between 700 and 800,000 families out of the Bolsa family because they were receiving something else. 
Nowadays, you have these huge computer files, and you can compare the computer files to see who has more than one benefit, maybe two, three, four benefits. And so to reduce this, uh, let's say, you might call it overpayment, but to reduce this and try to reduce expenditures, they've done this with Bolsa Family and others. They're looking at uh, sick leave, because the NASS gives sick leave benefit to people who are sick, who are supposedly legally sick. Uh, but they've now looked at all these people who are supposedly receiving sick leave benefits, and they're back working, or they're receiving one or two other benefits in addition to the sick leave benefits. So they're trying to eliminate the duplication of, of benefits. So Bolsa Familia is not going to disappear, but it's probably going to have the number of families somewhat reduced. What Temer did, which was uh, really irritated Gilman and the PT, as soon as Temer took over, he increased the allotment of the Bolsa Familia, which had not been increased for two years. So uh, this was a, a huge blow to the PT and to Gilma, because he comes in and he says, okay, you haven't increased the, the amount of the Bolsa Familia for two years. They're due for an increase. Maybe it was like 15% or something like that. So uh, <clears throat> not going to be eliminated, but will be, you might say, perfected. <laughs> um, just two bits, just two quick bits on the impact. So, so some comparative work on the Bolsa Familia has said uh, just two things that, that I think we've learned is that first is that these conditional cash transfers, first of all, they're, they're, they're provenly programmatic, so that they're, they're, they're pretty impervious to political manipulation, right? And the people know this. Um, they know it's, that it's they're imper not... It's impervious because they're giving, they're given a, 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 a bank ATM card. Right. And they go and they draw out the money themselves. They don't have to go to the mayor to get the money in their hot little hand. They have the woman, usually it's the woman, the, the mother of the family, she has the ATM card that she can go and draw out the, the allotment. Now, many, many small municipalities don't have a bank. What do you do? You go to the lottery office. Every municipal in Brazil has a lottery office. And you can use your ATM card at the lottery office to draw out your allotment. Yeah, so these cards, that, those cards that I was showing you before, right? That, that's the, the ATM card. So, so you break the connection exactly. between having to go to, uh, you know, so you can take, you can go to an ATM and do that. But no. So the one thing is, the population knows that this is a is a programa de estado, right? It's a it's a it's a state policy, state as in state the institution, not individual states. Um, and what data has shown, both in Mexico and in Brazil and other places is that the, the political incumbent who first introduced it got a big payout. So for example, in that sense, Lula, or in Mexico, it was you know the pre uh, at first. Um, but then people knew that to not benefit other people. So that didn't transfer to the governors, that didn't transfer to the mayors. So, so that avenue was closed. Um, it's become such an accepted part. Um, it benefits so many people, especially in the Northeast and in the North. Um, in the pockets of poverty that I don't think, and it's relatively cheap, right? It's relatively mm -hmm. small as a component of GDP. So it's not the first thing that people would go for. I, I can see why politically, like symbolically, Temer would go and raise it a little bit to, to kind of see if he can get some of the rub off. <laughs> but um, I don't see it necessarily as, as being, you know, I like to believe that we're not gonna return to the age of clientelistic politics in the Northeast because people grow, right? People learn, um, and they learn programmatic ways of doing things. So I don't think that old avenue where, so for example, where people like Antonio Carlos Magalhães could control the appointments of every teacher in the public schools and the local level and the directors of hospitals and things like that. I, you know, there's, there's still enough of that to go around, but I don't think it's quite at that level anymore. So I think Bolsa Familia is, is, is an established part of, you know, it, in the way that social security is the, is the third rail of American politics, I'm not sure that anybody would openly attack Bolsa Familia because no good can come from it. Um, only bad things can come from it. Like Research has shown that good won't come of it anymore. Now it's established, mm -hmm. right? So. That's, that's right. Um, you uh, said that the mayors are looking for the resources from the federal government. Um, how can the uh, federal government improve its revenue collection could it be that they want to uh, increase the formal economy as the, opposed to the informal economy? Could they uh, put more people into the formal economy by, uh, for example, credit cards or uh, checks uh, instead of cash? Um, can you talk about that? Well, increasing revenues is, is, is problematic. Brazil has quite a lot of 
uh, income tax evasion, especially by large companies. And so the tax authority is working very diligently to try to reduce tax evasion. And the other way is to increase the level of taxes, the, the percentage, but that's very unpopular to increase, increase taxes. Uh, the other is to create more jobs, so you have more people working and more people contributing to uh, income tax. Uh, that's the standard way. If you have a, an economy that's moving positively, you're creating new jobs and you have more people employed <laughs> and paying taxes. But we're in a recession uh, mode right now, and so that's not working very well. The revenue sharing with the municipalities is based on federal revenue. <coughs> and so when federal revenues decline, that means the, the, ta the income, the resource sharing with the municipalities declines. As, as, as you saw, we have 500, 5,568 5, municipalities. At least 2,500 of those municipalities have zero local revenues. They depend exclusively on the transfer from the federal government and some transfers from the, from the state government. So when those transfers decline, these municipalities get into very bad shape. They have to, they have to fire people uh, out of the public service in the municipality and reduce their, um, reduce their programs. And so this has created a, a terrible crisis in a lot of municipalities. Uh, We've seen states right now in Brazil that are in an extremely bad fiscal situation. The state of Rio and the state of Rio to pay their basic uh, expenditures. That means hospitals have no syringes, they have no penicillin, they have no, no gauze, they have nothing. The, the doctors are three, four, five, six months without any pay. So you have massive strikes in your hospitals. Teachers and other public employees in the state of Rio have gone several months without any pay. And the governors have now parceled out the payment, the, the salary <coughs> to the state employees. You don't get your full salary at the beginning of the month. It's paid in four or five segments or installments during the month. So we have state governments that are in extremely bad fiscal shape as well, like especially the state of Rio and the state of Rio Grande do Sul. Just to follow up, on uh, the uh, IRS of uh, Brazil, how much power do they have uh, do they have enough power to collect the taxes? They have considerable power, but they don't have as much power as the IRS has here. You've probably seen some propaganda, some commercials on TV of, of tax, tax consultants who say, we can help you with your IRS problem. <laughs> so the IRS here is much more, let's say, much more powerful in going after tax evaders than is our SRF, our Federal Tax Service in Brazil. Although the Federal Tax Service has, has had some increments in its power and especially being able to compare uh, data files. Uh, so if you, for example, you look at, at the data files for, for, for firms or businesses and you see what were their social security contributions on their employees. So then you compare that to the level of their income tax that's paid. So you have sort of an average for the size of the firm. And if the firm is way below the average, you go after them because you know they're evading. And so the, the income tax people in Brazil now have better access to to comparing computer files. Yeah, the big evaders, right, in Brazil are not the working class, just like They're it not. isn't anywhere else, because those are the people that comes out of the paycheck. Direct. So it's either yeah. the informal economy, but really the big tax evaders are, are the employers, are big, the large companies. Big, and those big, are the ones companies. where the loopholes used to be, you know, was an, an, they're closing in on those, but it's we're not even close to getting, you know, so that's a big part of the debate right now. So how is it that you square off these accounts? The, the, the Timur government approach is uh, you got to cut expenditures. They want to put this crazy cap for 20 years on, on public expenditures, try to run a household without being able to raise the budget for 20 years. Anyway, but, but the one part that has, you know, many people complain about is the fact that, you know, you're not really chasing down the highest evaders. There's a lot of money left out there, both either in subsidies, mm -hmm. right? The, a bunch of subsidies spread out uh, inefficiently. And, um, and also tax evasion. But, you know, there's... They're slowly closing in. The pockets of efficiency, Evan said a long time ago in Brazil are in the financial and planning ministries and later spread out to other social policy ministries. But, but those people are well-trained. Uh, they're technically expert. I mean, they didn't have a lot of political power before, but they, you know, but they are slowly closing these loops, but not fast enough. I mean, the level of taxation in Brazil is at a level where in percent of GDP is comparable to Western European democracies. Okay, the economy is smaller. 
But so we're not, you know, many Brazilians feel like you're not getting enough of bang for the buck in terms of how much you're being done. Exactly. 39%. Yeah. So, I mean, so I think, at, especially in this current stage, raising the level of taxation, is, is, nobody would try that. So it's a matter of trying to do more of what you have and trying to, you know, to find these loopholes, these... But well, like, like I showed you in the slide on the Social Security reform, we have an increasing Social Security deficit, but we have a huge amount of non-payment of Social Security contributions, especially by large firms. I put it at 700 billion. Mm -hmm. if, we, if, we could, if we could close that, and the firms would actually contribute their Social Security contributions as legally they have to, we wouldn't have any Social Security deficit. Oh, yeah. it's, a, it's a big problem. If a person wants to retire, and he has his work card and his contracts, and he goes into the Social Security, he says, oh, okay, I have enough years to retire. So the Social Security looks at it and says, well, for that 15 years when you work for Company X, your contributions were not passed on to the, to the Social Security Administration. The company deducted the Social Security contribution from your paycheck, but they kept it, and they didn't pass it on. Yes, yeah, so that's a, a real problem for a lot of people who are trying to retire, because the companies were at miss, or, or let's say bad news, because to make to sort of close out their accounts, they did pass on your Social Security contributions or of anybody in the company to the Social Security Administration. So that people come and try to retire and they can't because the, the contributions weren't registered. George, oh, sorry, buddy. Uh, I want to go back to the ideology issue. And the part of the ideology is that the Brazilian speed it up in the US. One looks at the PT success initially as to some degree based on an ideological position. I wonder what's the role of necessity to create coalitions? Because it seems to me that the undermining of the possibility of maintaining the ideological position is the practical politics of federal rule and required coalitions which encourage the fragmentation of the parties. And that would be somewhat different from the argument you're making in terms of you know, the, uh, the interconnection between the higher offices. Well, I don't think necessarily. I think it is actually, maybe it's a component of the story that I didn't make so clear. But I think, you know, when the PT was building from the grassroots up, um, it could afford to be ideologically coherent. Um, and that's how it first made its name. Um, but the story that, for example, Wendy Hunter tells and other people tell, you know, David Samuels also told this story, I think, is, is when they made the decision to become a professional political party that they wanted to win, right? 1995. Yeah, so, so <laughs> at some point they made the decision that, all right, we're either going to stick to our guns and be a small ideological. party ideological for our whole life, or we want to win and be transformational, but for that we're going to have to allow ourselves to change. You know, so if you want to think in terms of the theories of, of how political parties operate, so, so they basically either adapted their linkage strategies or they switched their linkage strategies. So they, the one that worked in the southern Brazil and southeastern Brazil wasn't going to work because of the way that people were used to doing politics. In, in the expectations of politicians were different, the, the, you know, so, so to win at the national level, they had to relax the, the approach to coalitions, which was central to the way that they used to do before. They used to stay on brand, and then they had to open up. And then by opening up, they had to then start doing business with people who weren't attached to the message, who weren't also, sold on them. Aren't they also losing some of the more ideological members of the party? To a certain extent, yes. The ones to, towards the left of the PT, yes, yes but, but a lot of the people stayed. But, they, but the people to the left or end of the, to that, the left end? That, that undermined. Ideological position. Yes. Yes. To a great extent. Yes. Everything was working toward making them a party like everybody. Yeah, the normalization, right? The people like Jacques Wagner and the people like um, you know José Gisil to a lesser extent, but those are the people who are more pragmatic, right? I mean, if you listen to you know the things that Jacques Wagner will say on the record, I mean, are he's incredibly honest about it. He's like, hey man, I mean. We're here, we want to win. This is how you do politics. That's politics. And that's how you do it. You know, and he even said one day that, you know, he said, you know, if you've never tasted honey or if you've never tasted molasses, the first time you eat it, you get messed up. You nunca comer molasses quando come se lambuza, right? He said, you know, the PT got overwhelmed by this, by, you know, seeing, getting to the pot of honey at the first time. But so I agree with you. Is it possible for the PT to return to an ideological party? 
I, that's what we were talking about, the refounding of the PT, right? So maybe they're being helped already by this because all the, oppor the opportunists, they leave when you no longer control the spigot, right? So in a way, all the dirty ones that you don't want to keep anyway are gone. Uh, or, or, or if they're not all gone, they're, they're mostly jail, gone, they're right? <laughs> no, but the people, you know, those people who switch into the parties left and right. So I think what's left are the people who believe in the mission. Because if you ran as a PT candidate nowadays, you got to really believe in it because it's now it's a detriment to you right at least tasted honey refound and that's the big fight inside the pit right now so are the old elites going to let the new blood come in and reinvent the pit but closer to the ideological mission or are you going to have these you know the the boca de cachimbo right so the, the the bad habits that you've picked up i we don't know it's too early to tell in, Bra in, Bra in Brazil, we have a saying that sometimes bad things come for the good. And so this bad thing that has happened to the PT might, in the end, produce some good of, so, of a reformed PT. So create a minority party. Yeah. The best example of this, I, I, have, a, I have a neat cartoon and, and picture back in 2012 when the PT elected the mayor of Sao Paulo. Malufi took uh, Adagi, the PT candidate, took his hand and took him to the house of Paulo Malufi. Malufi is perhaps the most corrupt politician that Brazil has ever seen. And they went and had lunch with Malufi so that Malufi and his party would support the PT candidate for mayor. And that's the maximum of pragmatism you can ever find in Brazilian politics. And so there's this neat cartoon of Lula and Malufi carrying Adagi on their shoulders and saying, my God, this is a real heavy load <laughs> for the two of us to carry. And they ended up uh, electing Adagi as, as mayor. Uh, and so that's a, a very good example of, of pragmatism. You want to win, you have to make some compromises and some agreements uh, to, to, to win. When jo jo José Dirceu became the, the new president of the PT in 95, the, it all changed to pragmatism. Unfortunately, Dirceu is in jail right now. But he was, uh, he was the mastermind of this pragmatism of the PT. George, if uh, the PT is having problems becoming the new boss in Bahia, a very important state, as per your data, and is there any other party emerging to take a place for fear? Well, the PT did become the new boss in Bahia, right? And it still is. I mean, to the, to the extent, right? I mean, they're losing, but they didn't lose anywhere as much as they lost everywhere else. But the big fight is, believe it or not, um, what people thought at one point was extinct, which is the PFL, the, the, the party of the right in Brazil, um, who's now resurfacing. So who's the next, you know, so David earlier said that if you win and you get reelected for mayor of a capital city, you kind of become the natural candidate for governor yeah, that's the next case. time. And you know who that is? The Antonio Carlos Magalhães Neto. The so you might, be re you might be seeing in Bahia, unfortunately, the return, you know, just switching back into the old, um, a little to the a old little more modern. A little modernized modern. version. Oh, he's a he's a modernized version. He is a new generation, right? right? I mean, he posts pictures of himself going out to carnival and drinking a beer on his he's Twitter. So I mean, he is. <laughs> he's a more free market. He's a more free market, less blatantly clientelistic version. But you know that that might seriously happen in Bahia, right? So where's the transformation? See, Asiami, the governor. The master politician of Bahia. Yeah, who used to be he the died, big he dog, died in, right? in Ju July of 2007. Yeah. And so the, the grandson was elected mayor in 2012 and re-elected again by a huge majority yeah. in Salvador, I don't know, 70% or 80% of the vote. And he is or will become the prime candidate yeah. uh, for governor in, in the 2018. The PT didn't even run a candidate in Salvador, right? So Salvador is the third largest city in Brazil, historically has voted opposition. The PT didn't even feel the candidate this year. They let the, their communist friends take the thumping on their behalf. I mean, they, <laughs> they, they basically weren't in alliance with them, but they said, you know, there's no way that we're going to win so after running and losing forever. Just let somebody else do it. They, they didn't even feel the candidate because they knew that, that, you know, so they waited this one out. So, yeah, in, in 2016, if you compare it with 2012, the PT fielded a lot less candidates for mayor yeah. in 2016 than in 2012, mm -hmm. in part because some of their people who ran for re-election had already switched parties. But they were just pragmatic, like in Salvador. We don't want to waste our resources on an election we're going to lose. <clears throat> so uh, in, in many cities, they, looking, did, looking they didn't at, run a candidate for mayor. They ran, ran in a coalition. We're running out of time. I have 
very fast on over the five main macro regions in Brazil, northeast, north, north. And then you have the center west, southeast, and south. I want to tell you, in the northeast, is there, how close are we? Probably not, uh, to fragmentation or to hegemony of one or two. Uh, to who is that? Who is that in the northeast? Well, it's still the PMI de Bay, right? I mean, there's a couple, of, there's there's different realities in each state. So the PSDB is, is decently strong, um, the PDT now, etc. But but it's really the, the, the PMI de Bay recaptured this spot, right? The PMI de Bay is the local level party in Brazil. And that's why it's so powerful in the in Congress, because it's the party that has the penetration. Um, and it, it elected the, the most number mayors. Of senators and yeah. largest number of deputies. Of deputies. So and you need the mayors for that, right? through the Northeast, right? We're not quite yeah, I think the payment is the largest party in Brazil at this point, and it's pretty evenly spread. Um, let, let me go back to all the way to the south. The south, the south region. Rio do Sul, Santa Catarina, and Paraná. What party is hegemonic or two parties? I don't know, I think you're going to get a lot of pain in the bay, but then what you're going to get is the second one, you're going to get some variation. You're going to get the PSIB sometimes, and sometimes you're going to get the PSIB, which is this party that was created, this fake party on the right, so that if you want to be Kassabi. of the right, yeah, but, but it's an opportunistic party by, by design because it was designed for people who were in the PFL, in the PSIB, in other places. So if you wanted to be Gioma, but you didn't. You couldn't stay in your party on the right. Then you joined this party. So, so the, the south is going to be center right. Yeah, the past the bay has a couple of the 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 past the bay has a couple of states that it's really really strong in. Right, São Paulo disproportionately, Minas it's decently strong, but not as strong as you would think. Well, because right, they right, 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 south first. Well, yeah. in, in the south, the PS to be elected the mayor of Porto Alegre, mm -hmm. who is the son of. Uh, uh, Nelson Marquez. Yeah. Yeah. But the PSDB increased a lot in the number of mayors it elected in the state of Ruben. So, so the PSDB became a larger party in, 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 in Ruben. So, right. It also it, it has the, the governor of the state of Paraná, who's not that popular, but the PSDB increased the number of mayors in Paraná and also in Santa Catarina. So the PSDB has become stronger in the south than it was before. But the PT had very little presence. That's true. That's true. How about, how about the southeast? I mean, São Paulo, Minas Gerais. Yeah, that's the big pass in the Bay Area, right? And then now the, those parties of the of the evangelical right in Rio, in Rio are strong. Also in the Belo Horizonte, yes. small yeah. party too, right? No, no, the Belo Horizonte is a uh, humanistic party. Allied to the, to the PT. Yeah, but that's more of an outlier, I think. An outlier. Right. What, what we have on tap right now is a a, a new constitutional amendment, which has already been approved by the Senate, which would impose a threshold barrier on elections for deputy. If you don't get 2% of the vote, you don't have any more time on TV and you don't have any more participation in the party fund. And that probably will reduce the number of parties in the Chamber of Deputies down to maybe 9 or 10. Then they have another very, very harsh uh, uh, change, political reform, is prohibit coalitions for deputy. Maybe at least 15 parties don't elect anyone by themselves. They can only elect someone in coalition. So if you eliminate coalitions, you've got to eliminate maybe 10, 15 parties. So if this amendment is approved in the chamber for 2018, we're going to see a, a major movement of, of, of fusions, of mergers, and incorporations of parties going together to form a party, maybe five or six small parties going together to form a a party to get over this threshold. So that's a big change coming in Brazilian politics, perhaps early next year. What happened to the attempt to restrict the, the jumping parties? Oh, party switching. Well, there is a party loyalty law, <coughs> which was not passed by Congress. It's called judicial as a court. <coughs> courts imposed uh, party, party loyalty. So there, there is a norm about party switching, but it's not really that enforced that much. It was enforced a lot in 2008 and 9, right after this was approved by the, by the election court and the Supreme Court. But there, there is still an, an amount of party switching, especially when you, when you organize a new party. Anyone can change and switch to this new party. So they organized a party called the Party of the Brazilian Woman, PMB. And so about 30 deputies switched into this new party. But then, earlier this year, they switched back out. 
So there's only two deputies in this party of PMV, the Brazilian Women's Party. If None we, of the two deputies are women. If we were to continue without our time to, to review center, center west, the center west, the north, we will also reach the conclusion that it's either PMDB or PSDB. Yeah, the PMDB is a big winner. The big stepped into that <laughs> hole, into <laughs> that vacuum, right? Um, but a lot of other opportunistic parties too. I mean, there's not okay. one big winner. Well, what I hear though is that the left is really bad shape. It's really bad shape. And not only the PT, but also its allies and the other parties. Yeah, but some of the votes have transferred back to the communists, right? So in yeah, Maranhão, yeah. for example, yes. the communists did well. You see that in Rio de Janeiro, you had the, the candidate from the PSOL who didn't win, but did the best that a candidate from that party has ever done. So, I mean, there are voters who want to express voter left preferences. It's just right now it's not quite determined yet who, which party that will be. Because at one point people thought Marina Silva was going to be that, right? right? And now nobody knows. So. Marina Silva is really doing a big hit. Yeah, she only elected five mayors. Yeah. So, so you know, so we don't, they, it's not quite clear who the, you know, who's going to be the, the viable option for the left. But there are two years left, right? So you don't yeah, really know. Yeah, okay, so the next two years. We for the next two years, at least. We don't know. We look for the next two years, the PMDB, the PSDB, and PSD, and those parties. Yeah, you know, the we'll center have, parties you know, are the ones that, uh, that really So the Tamil government should do, we'll go back to the earlier question, should do reasonably well with that, that coalition? Reasonably well, except the Social Security re reform is a big, a big division. Uh, and and Tamil's coalition is going to fall apart a little bit on Social Security reform. Mm -hmm. So what are you predicting for? And I always stop with that. What are you predicting for the for the next three years? Coherence or more or less. fragmentation? More or less fragment. A little bit of fragmentation, but more or less coherence. More or less. Georgie. Well, I, I defer to David on that, but I think it all depends on whether the economy grows or not. That's, That's what true. we're going That's to see, right? That's true. So if if all this belt tightening that they're doing and all this, uh, you know, in the northeast, you say the cuts with the machete of Facom, right? Um, if all these things that they're doing spits out like a, a rebound, then then they might come look much better next two years from now than they do right now. But it, but if, if if it all goes, you know, it's unpredictable, David. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it is. It is. Mauricio. It depends. It depends on the private sector investment. Yeah. The private sector to go back to investing, then that would that would get us any, out of the Any final session. comment or question? Well, thank you. Two excellent presentations and